Amen. Let's open our Bibles, if you have your Bible with you tonight, to Proverbs chapter number 8. Proverbs chapter number 8. Let's read a few verses here and then we'll have prayer and get right into the message tonight. Proverbs chapter number 8, verse number 1. Proverbs 8, verse number 1. Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth on the top of high places, by the way and the places of the paths. She crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in, at the doors. Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of man. O ye simple, understand wisdom. And ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. They are all plain to him that understandeth, and right to them that find knowledge. Lord, we pray you bless the message tonight. Thank you for this blessed book. Lord, we sometimes even take it for granted and don't realize the, the, uh, the truth or the importance of having the words of truth. God, I pray that you may bless the message and bring these words to life and help us to get a hold of them. And we pray that these words would get a hold of us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're coming along in Proverbs and we get to chapter number 8. And here again, like all through Proverbs, there's a constant appeal. There's a constant calling where truth and where wisdom is calling out for people to listen. Whoever wants to hear, listen up. And here we have this chapter opening up the same way as we've already seen in several other places here in Proverbs, this constant appeal and constant call, crying out for people to listen to the words of wisdom. And so we have not just a vivid description of the words of wisdom, but we also see in this chapter where those words of wisdom come from. Now, I want to give you a few things uh, as far as words of wisdom from just man before we get into this. I've, some of it's good and some of it's kind of humorous. The first few are very true, and you've probably heard some of them. Somebody said some of these things. Uh, many people will walk in and out of your life, but only true friends will leave footprints in your heart. It's pretty true. To handle yourself, use your head. To handle others, use your heart. That's good advice. Here's a good one. Anger is only one letter short of danger. If someone betrays you once, it's his fault. If he betrays you twice, it's your fault. That's that old saying, fool me once, it's on me. Fool me, or fool me once, it's on you. Fool me twice, it's on, it's on me. Here, I like this one. I've heard it said different ways. Um, great minds discuss ideas. Average minds discuss events. Small minds discuss people. <laughs> That's good. But when you get in a thing and you're always talking about what somebody did or whatever, think, you know, I'm kind of belittling my intelligence here. I'm getting low here. He who loses money loses much. He who loses a friend loses much more. He who loses faith loses all. Beautiful young people are accidents of nature. But beautiful old people are works of art. <laughs> <laughs> learn from the mistakes of others you can't live long enough to make them all yourself <laughs> some people are working on it though <laughs> now here's words of wisdom from kids I like these never trust a dog to watch your food <laughs> when your dad is mad and asks you do I look stupid do not answer him <laughs> never, never tell your mom her diet's not working <laughs> Another kid said, stay away from prunes. <laughs> Puppies still have bad breath even after eating Tic Tacs. You can't hide a piece of broccoli in a glass of milk. <laughs> if you want a kitten, start out by asking for a horse. That might work. Felt markers are not good to use as lipstick. Don't pick on your sister when she's holding a baseball bat. <laughs> when your mom is mad at your dad, don't let her brush your hair. 
And finally, never try to baptize a cat. <laughs> That's bad advice. But here we have the words of truth and just three things from this chapter. We'll look at the truth in the world of error. We'll look at treasure in the midst of trash. And we'll look at, at uh, timeless truth in a transitory age. In verses 1 through 9, we see truth in a world of error. We notice in verse number 5, he says, Oh, you simple, understand wisdom, and you fools, be ye of an understanding heart. You have to believe with the heart God and the Scriptures before you understand with the head. This is so very important. I, I like to read a lot, as you know. I'm always, man, I thought after I graduated school and stuff and Bible college and things like that, you know, all my hard le learning and studying is over, but it's just beginning. And I'm always in the middle of something, and it's a constant battle. And what I've seen on both sides of the issue, whether it be atheism, whether it be philosophy, whether it be other religions, or whether it be Bible believers, I find super intelligent people over here. I mean, su there's, some, there's some guys, you read some of this stuff, they're not even believers, man, and some of the things they're able in their minds to take, whether it be history, whether it be hard, the hard sciences, you know, real science, or whether it be philosophy, they're able to take some of those things and summarize it, take it, break it down. They have all their source material. They take all of this material and they can, uh, all this eclectic material, collect it, collate it, stew it down into a few paragraphs and put it over to play. That's, 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 in, that's intelligence. And you can get that. Then you'll find somebody over here who does believe, right? And they can take stuff, they can stew it down, they can present it and give it to you. Intelligent minds on both sides of the, of, of the aisle. The issue is, where do you start from? Years ago, I preached a series on the King James Bible issue, and one of the first messages was, was called the presupposition of the King James Bible debate. And really, that's the presupposition's faith. Uh, and you find people over here that say, you know, we believe in God, we believe in Jesus Christ, and we believe in a Bible. Well, we don't believe there's a perfect Bible anywhere. They have made a presupposition, and they're going to find evidence to fill in the blanks. They're going to find evidence to put in there to try to back up their idea. But that's their starting point. They do not believe it's possible ever that you could have a book in your lap that's infallible. Maybe one that was originally given 500 years ago, or I should say 2,000 years ago with the apostles, but not one in your lap today. They, they start off with that premise. On the other side of the spectrum is us, and we're just dumb enough to say, you know what? We believe if God preserved everything in creation, He preserves our soul, He can preserve His Word. That's our presupposition. He that cometh to God must believe that He is. So intelligence has nothing to do with it. IQ has nothing to do with it. You know, there are people that are not very educated that have high IQs. They might not know all the mathematical formulas to put a man on the moon, but they have a high IQ. They might not have read a lot of books, but their IQ could be high. So when you begin to deal with wisdom and understanding, this has nothing to do with how quick-witted you are with intelligence. This has to do with your heart, not just with your head. Now, some of us may have smaller heads than others, and it takes a long time. I'm one of those that I have to go through something a gazillion times before I get it. And then when I get it, I got it. But good night, man. I had to beat it in my head five a gazillion times. And some of you, you read something or you study something, you learn something, first time you got it. Do much is given, much is required. But that's not the issue. The issue is when God gives you something, does it go in the heart? And do you start off with the premise, trusting God, believing God, looking to God for wisdom? Have you ever thought about how many civilized people, and I say civilized, I'm talking about if you go back and study history, Go back to 1700s, 1800s, early 1900s. How many civilized people walking around just as sane as anybody else that believed all kind of things that weren't true? I mean, go back just look them up. I'm not going to, you can go do a Google search when you get home. You know, the old remedies. Some of you grew up and your grandmamas had these crazy remedies, and now you realize it's basically one shy step of superstition. Just silly stuff. You know, and it's stuff that people would good walking around since believed. Just as serious as a heart attack. Back in the days of George Washington, when somebody got sick, you take a knife and you cut them on the wrist and you start draining out all their blood. The top minds of civilized culture believe that. I wonder what we're walking around believing that's absolutely nuts. And I've often thought about Jesus walking around having all the knowledge, knowing everything, and he had to keep his mouth shut. 
He didn't give any advanced scientific information, say, hey, let me go ahead and tell you how to make the cotton gin. Save you a lot of work later on. They're like, cotton, how do you, you mean you can make clothes out of, out of plants? Oh, that's, that's a little ahead of your time. Okay, yeah, you're using linen still. <laughs> You know, you ever think about that? I mean, here's, here's knowledge, all the knowledge of all the time walking around, and he just lives in the time in which he is. That, that is just tripping me out. And then I think about the philosophies and the religions of the day, how they're walking around. You have Catholics walk around really thinking Mary's the mother of God. They really believe that. Mary is not the mother of God. My mother's older than me. I'm not the smartest thing. You know, I might have been born at night, but not last night. Uh, you got to be older than God if you're the mother of God. Holy Mother Mary, Holy Holy Mother Mary, uh, Holy whatever they say, Mother of God, blessed be the fruit of thy womb. You know, she's not the mother of God. She's the mother of the man Christ Jesus in time. Jehovah's Witness really believe that Jesus is a separate God, and that hell's the grave. They're able to operate an automobile. People running around in automobiles believing this stuff. Charismatic people thinking that you can go up, you know, and talk in these other languages or talk in these gibberish and the stuff's really from God. Walking around, you know, some of them maybe, you know, working on people's teeth and operating on people. That's a scary thing. Truth in a world of error. We are in a mixed up world. We're in a world where... People can be stirred up emotionally about something and there not be a lick of truth about it. But they are so, they're ready to die for something that's not even true. Notice the content of truth, verse number six excellent things. You want to get to a level of excellence in your life? Get in the Bible. Notice verses six and verse number eight right things. This world is so wrong. Thank God the Bible is right. Notice in verse number 9, I like this. Plain things. Sound words, straight words, simple words. Verse 9 is real good for those that say, the Bible, you can't understand it. Verse 9, they are all plain to him that understand it. The thing is, if you want to understand, God will help you understand. You're not going to understand everything about the Bible. There are mysteries in the Bible I have not figured out yet. A bunch of mysteries in the Bible. There are things in the Bible I don't have a grasp on. I don't understand completely. I don't think we'll ever understand everything. That shows you that it's God. God is infinite. We're finite. So we have, but we do know the Bible is very plain. The Bible doesn't have to mince words about what sin is. Very clear, very plain. And what sin was... 1,500 years ago, 3,500 years ago, is sin today. God hasn't changed. God's standards of holiness hasn't changed. Man's the one who's changed. And I know cultures change and governments change. And just because your liberties one day may change, it doesn't mean God's truth has changed. Somebody said, when water's clear, you can see right to the bottom of the pool. You ever go in some of these springs and stuff and... You've been out there and you're looking down 60, 70 feet all the way down to the bottom. But you know, you can, after a rain, if you have an old dirt road or something, there can be just a little, a little a horse hoof print an inch thick. And if it's muddy, you can't even see to the bottom of it. God's truth is clear and plain. And it might be deep, but it's plain. It might be beyond our mental capacities to really grasp it, but it's plain. God said He made everything. How much plainer do you want to get? I ain't going to get into all the details about it. God made it. That settles it. There's a heaven, there's a hell. I don't understand. She said it was hell in the center of the earth. The Bible says it is. How do you explain that? I don't know. I just really don't think they drilled a hole and put a microphone down there. I'm not that dumb. I know they did scare tactics and tried to hear the screams of hell. How are you going to get a microphone down into this thing that's so hot, man? The thing's going to burn up. I mean, <laughs> come on. I don't have to have modern tactics to try to scare people into God's plain truth. God said there's a hell and it's a fire. It's a fire that burns the soul. And it's not something I want to deal with. Not something I'm going there and thank God I've been saved from that. Amen. I don't understand New Jerusalem, 1,500 square miles, top, bottom, side. I don't get all that. How are we all going to fit in there? The Bible says all, all people from the church age will be in there. All people in the body of Christ from the cross on. We're going to fit. We're going to be in there. 
I know that. I don't understand it. A lot of things I don't understand, but I believe it. And God's clear about it. Then notice the contrast of truth, verses 7 and 8. My mouth shall speak truth, and the wickedness is an abomination to my lips. The Lord does that all the time. He not only tells us the content, okay, it's plain, it's excellent, it's right. You can see that, and it's good to rejoice in that, but there's always that negative. There's always that grind. And I've been out of the workforce. I've been out of the scene. I don't get it. I understand. Some of you are dealing with stuff to where if you say a certain thing or you express a certain opinion, they will fire you from your job. That's going on right now. Because of personal beliefs, they fire you. They're not worried about being sued at all. I don't get that. I used to think that Americans can believe whatever you want to believe. You have the freedom of uh, religion. Freedom of belief or expression. You used to have the freedom of speech. I don't get that. So sometimes when we get in here and we begin to preach and we show the contrast, that thing begins to grind. You're thinking, I can't believe he just said that. If I was to say that at work around the coffee cooler, they'd fire me. Yeah, that's where the thing's eventually coming. But there's always a contrast, and God points out truth, and He points out truth alongside of error, and He points out righteousness alongside of wickedness. Somebody's doing something bad, you say, what is it? Yes, you make a moral determination. Here's what's happened in our great land, in our wicked land. Absolute moral truth has been done away with. If you make a moral assessment and say, that is wrong, that is bad, that is evil, that is wicked... You're the bad guy for saying that. God says it all the time. God said, this is right, this is wrong. This is good, this is bad. He contrasts wickedness. Notice he contrasts that which is forward. Look in verse, um, verse number uh, seven's wickedness. Verse number 8, there's nothing forward. We, we defined that last couple times, moving away from. So in other words, if you move Toward wickedness, you're moving away from God. You're moving away from righteousness. See, the, the church has been trying to pull the two together for a long time. They've been bringing in worldly entertainment, worldly music, and worldly philosophies. They've been trying to mix the world and the church all the time. And that's a bad place to do because you can't get close to God and try to get close to the world at the same time. If you're going to get close to God, you can tell people in the world, hey, come join us. But when you go try to join them to bring them to God... You're not gonna ha it's not going to happen. And so forward is an abomination to God. And then notice also he mentions in verse 8, that which is perverse. And so we have the contrast of truth. Wisdom is truth in a world of error. And I'm so glad that we can have the truth. There's so much confusion out there. Man, this is such a relativistic society. There's no... Right and wrong, except what they determine is right and wrong. And you say, who is they? I don't know who they is. But they're always the experts, aren't they? Notice in verses 10 to 21, we have the treasure in the midst of trash. Verse number 10, receive my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. He begins to compare and contrast and say that wisdom is better than all these, these things you could hope to have. Notice verse number 11, wisdom is better than rubies. And all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. Verse 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy and the evil weight and the forward mouth do I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom I have understanding and I have strength. Notice we have the reality and whether people realize it's the reality or not, it doesn't matter. It is the truth. Instruction is better than silver. Now, I know there are people that would rather earn an extra dollar than sit down and be instructed. In other words, if they had an opportunity to work overtime, if they have an opportunity to uh, not sit and listen to instruction as far as preaching goes, as far as Bible teaching goes, they would go ahead and go out and earn that extra money, and that, wouldn't, that would be more important to them than sitting and receiving spiritual instruction. A lot of people, that's the case. Then he says knowledge is better than gold. 
If you want to exercise faith, then you've got to have the facts to exercise the faith in. And then he says, wisdom is better than rubies. And then wisdom is better than... Look at it in verse number 11. All the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. Is that really how you feel? I hope that is. And sometimes I wonder if I feel that way or if I just talk it. I can desire a pretty good bit. <laughs> whatever fits your fancy, you know, whatever your thing is, whether it's, you know, houses and lands or whether it's uh, families and parties and fellowship and being around people or whatever your ideal paradise is that you desire as far as material things. You know, whether it's, uh, you know, eating some Twinkies and and uh, listening to a good bluegrass gospel concert, drinking some iced tea, or whatever the, whatever the scenario you want to paint, whatever the thing that you desire. Maybe it's better health and being back in your times of your youth or maybe being able to take a nice trip and see some of the wonders of the world, some of the sights of the world, and to be able to experience those kind of things. Whatever it is. Whatever you can desire that would be great and that would be the epitome of bringing happiness maybe to the moment. God's wisdom is more than all of that. That's saying a lot. <laughs> and I, I really doubt most Christians feel that way. So how do you know? Because they don't read their Bibles. I'm not saying you, I'm saying most Christians. It's amazing the... All the Bible translations we have, we have all the, I say we, they have. I got one. <laughs> I mean, I have an office full of them, but you know what I mean. Um, people aren't that interested in that. They're more interested in entertainment. They're more interested in all of these things. And that shows you where the emphasis and the focus is. But the Bible says wisdom to be desired more than all that. That's a check for us to say, you know, do I really desire wisdom? God's wisdom from His Word more than all these things. That's a good question to ask ourselves. Notice He says in verse, uh, ver verse number 12, I wisdom dwell with prudence. Prudence is the ability to choose well and walk carefully. Then He gets right into verse number 3. He's got to be negative again. Verse 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate. Don't use that word. The fear of the Lord is to hate certain things. You see it here in verse 13. Pride, arrogancy, the evil way, the forward mouth. We preached on that last time so we won't belabor the point. But then you'll notice that the reality, the fear of the Lord brings these things. Verse number 14, counsel. Look at that. Sound wisdom. Understanding. And look at the last one. Strength. These things come from the Word of God and from God's wisdom. Amen. You ever think about this? God had a thought, and from that thought came everything you see. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He, all things were made by the breath of His mouth. He thought it, and He spoke it, and here it is. That's God's wisdom. And as he gets into a little bit later on, we see the incarnate Word, and then we see the, the, uh, the written Word, but... You think about God's wisdom. He gives you these things, counsel. You say, I don't know which direction to go. Okay, well, get in the Bible. Saturate your mind with God's mind. Fill your thoughts with God's thoughts, and then maybe your opinions will become His opinions. Maybe you'll begin to see things like God sees it. Amen. Uh, the multitude of counselors are a safety, the Bible says. A good thing to do is to run some ideas by Christians and people that you know are in the Bible, Christians that you know are walking with God, if they're walking with God and the direction that they're pointing in is different than you're thinking, maybe it's just a red flag to say, huh, let me, let me just double check this. Counsel. Some of your older folks in here, you have some advice and some wisdom that's buried deep down that some of us younger folks need to draw. The Bible says counsel man, you know, is like deep water. A man of understanding will draw it out. And I know that you don't go around and just, you know, unsolicited advice is never heeded, right? I mean, good night, you hand somebody a book, 500 pages, like, here you go, Merry Christmas. They're like, you expect me to read this? It ain't YouTube. I don't know what to do with it. A book, what is that? <laughs> but, you know, they don't want it. They didn't ask for it. 
You're handing them this, but if they come to you and say, hey man, I really need some help with something. They take their phone, they turn it off or whatever, and they're sitting there and they're waiting for you. They're asking for advice. They're looking for it. You can give it. Counsel, wisdom, and then that thing, strength. If we're going to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might, we've got to go to this source of wisdom. We've gotten so far away from Scripture. I like to read some of these old histories and things like that. And some of these people, like Abraham Lincoln, for example, you can't ever find a clear testimony of his salvation at all. However, he will reference the Bible. And a lot of those people back in that time were so saturated with Bible that you'll find references all throughout history and historic, historic personages, people. They will make quotations from Scripture. There are some references you can, you can talk about and say things and Christians sit there and just look at you. They don't even know what's in the Bible. Yeah. Treasure in the midst of trash. Everything's been dumbed down. They have all this stuff. We have to dumb everything down. Well, nobody understands it. Okay. I'm sure all the doctors, when they go to medical school, they dumb everything down. They say, look, you know, we ain't, we're not going to use this language that nobody understands. You know, you're just going to know this is a pink pill and this is a blue pill and this is an orange pill. And that's just the terminology we're going to use because it's just too hard to learn these Latin terms and these technical terms. Wisdom gives strength. Notice the reality. Treasure in the midst of trash. We are in the midst of trash. But then notice the request. Verse 17, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. You know, when you study the Great Awakenings, one thing that I'm interested in, I'm reading some uh, a, a volume of church history set now, and as it goes through the first and second, both, both Great Awakenings, I was not aware of this, but the majority of converts were young people. Majority of converts were... Uh, under under 28, majority of them. Adolescents in the 20s, early 30s. That's the majority of the converts. Those that seek me early shall find me. And you know, really, when you think about, if I was to give a survey and all of our church members, probably the majority of them were saved at a young age. When you're younger, your mind's like a sponge. And also, when you're younger, it's kind of like, you have a clean slate and you begin, to, you begin to wear those grooves in there. And if you wear them in there the right way, then it'll be a whole lot easier to develop habits young. You get used to a disciplined life because being a Christian is equated in Acts chapter 11 with being a disciple. Sometimes we make statements and people are like, man, that sounds weird, you know. You say, all saved people aren't Christians. And they're like, what are you talking about? Well, we're just being technical. I know nobody wants to be technical. But the Bible says the disciples were called Christians. What are you going to do with Demas when he left Paul? And he quits living the disciplined life. He's not living the life of a Christian anymore. What about Peter? And he's out there cussing God. You know, he's not living a disciplined life. There are people that hadn't been to church in 10 years that are saved. Hadn't read their Bible in 10 years, listened and preaching in 10 years, hadn't been doing anything spiritual in 10 years. They're going to heaven. But the, you wouldn't call them a Christian. You wouldn't even know they were saved. You know where I'm going with this. So the idea of seeking God early helps you to develop those habits. You young people, you, as you get older, and I understand, you know, kids 5, 6, 7, and 8 not going to read the whole Bible through and stuff like that. I, I get that. But as they begin to grow and they get a little older, they ought to start reading the Bible on their own. They ought to start developing some habits of memorizing Bible verses and realize it's not just because I have to do it for my assignments or my Sunday school teacher or my homeschool assignment or my parents are telling me, but hopefully it becomes where they develop a relationship and they realize the closest thing I have to God talking to me is that book. Amen. That's a holy book. This building's not holy. That baptism pool is not holy. This preacher's not holy. You ain't holy either, so quit looking at me like that. <laughs> These are the holy words of God. Amen. And if you seek them early, young people, it'll help you to develop the right habits and then avoid the wrong habits. 
That passage we read over in Proverbs chapter number 6, it talks about the cords of sin. You know, there are, I, I heard a story of a guy that was hooked on, uh, I think it was heroin, either heroin or, or uh, cocaine. I think it was cocaine. And he got in a fight with somebody early in the morning over some drug deal. The guy bit his finger off in the fight. I mean, it was hanging by the, the skin. But he had to have his cocaine so bad, he went on and went and got his coke hits. And it wasn't until 8 o'clock that night that he made it to the hospital because he had to have his cocaine. I'm telling you, there are things and habits that people develop to where they wish to God they could stop it, and they can't stop it. Too far gone. The flesh will not let go of it. And so that's why this stuff about seeking God early and giving God your heart early is so very important. I'll give you a few quotes by A.W. Tozer, the old preacher. He said, Ambition drives men, enslaves them, and then at the last hurls its victims down in disappointment. Human society has also arranged amusements in order to quiet the victim while death creeps nearer all the time. Everybody's in a panic. Everybody's running around. You have people that maybe have five to ten years left. I'm talking about some of the older folks that are involved in politics. You ever notice when you look at the Senate and the House and all, the, all these people walking around, they're supposed to be retired sitting in the backyard with their grandkids. They're running around the swamp up there. I'm talking about D.C. And here are all these people. they got two or three or four or five years left of their life, and they're all wrapped up in this stuff. For what? Or you have people that they get the RV and they get the camper and they get all the stuff and they get the retirement and here they go and they got three years. And they spend all this money, all these years just hoping and longing and looking for this new amusement in life where they could get all their money and go see the sights. And they got to stay at home because they got to go to the doctor every week now. I hate to be, you know, rain on your parade, but I'm just telling it like it is. Young people, I'm going to get you now. Oh, man, this next phone that comes out or this next fad that comes out, you're so pumped about it, you're so excited about it. These, 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 this music, this, these friends, or the excitement and, and being around these people and maybe these things that you're looking forward to doing and maybe your future and your plans, all these things. And, 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 and it's just all this amusement, all this stuff to keep your mind off of God. Right. Ambition. Here's another quote by Tozer. It's terrible to be content with things, ambitions, hopes, and dreams that laugh in your face. Hopes that will disappoint you and you will hear that hollow laughter when it is too late. Man, there are men that have sold their soul and they spend 30 and 40 years to make it to the top. They get to the top, they've lost their wife. They never see their kids anymore. They're hooked on alcohol. They're in the big office. They have so much more money than they can ever know what to do with. And they're miserable at night. Can't even go to sleep without taking a pill. Top of the ladder. These are the people we're, we looked in society that, hey, you know, these are the ones you want to be like, young people. Or you take some athlete, you know, some 20 something year old punk that has no brains got more money than he knows what to do with and you're supposed to model your life after him or her or it don't, don't push me there the reality the request notice the reward and thank God for this I'm glad the Lord tells us what we can get verse 21 that I may Cause those that love me to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasures. The Lord will bless you if you seek after His wisdom. He might not bless you in material things. You might be poor as Job's turkey. You might not be able to afford to go to Walmart. You might be shopping around at the, at the uh, you know, going to garage sales trying to get your clothes. Man, you can have the peace of God. You can have wisdom and not be hooked on drugs or have a family that's all messed up. Right. Wisdom. The reward. The problem is consumerism. All this push. Thou shalt not covet still in the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. 
And it's all this push to get the next thing, get the next thing, get the next thing, get the next thing. Get more money so you can get more stuff. Have you ever tried to sit down and do this? I hadn't done it, so I, I just read about it, and I was thinking it'd be kind of neat to do. Try to whittle down all of your possessions. And some of you are minimalist already, so you ain't got no problem with this. It's easy for you. You're like, yeah, I got the essentials. That's all I need. And maybe make a list of 50 essential items that you, that's all you have to have. Now, we're not going to give a hoarder's lesson here tonight, but can you imagine doing that? And some of you, you've had to sell houses. You've, had to, you've done that. You've downsized. You've moved. You've had yard sales, done all that kind of stuff. I understand. I've been there with you. But just to think of those 50 essential things and you go down, you realize how much you really need. Sometimes when I do have the privilege of traveling and going somewhere and, and I've got my stuff, I've got my, my room, I know, okay, I'm going here preaching. These are the things I'm, I'm able to really focus on what I'm there to do. I don't have all this other stuff. I'm not worried about getting out and cutting the grass and mowing the lawn and feeding the dog and doing this kind of stuff and running here and there. I'm, okay, this is here. I've got my stuff. This is, it's a little bit simple. We have complicated, or should I say the world has just tried to make you, you really don't have to be as busy as you think you are. We learned in this past chaos that you don't have to eat out as much. Now, I did miss some of my beloved Chick-fil-A. And I'm slowly getting back to that habit. But you don't have to have it. I mean, at the end of the day, you, you get full. I mean, what's the big deal? You realize you can be con we can be content with so much less. We are the same as far as humans, people. We're the same as the pioneers. Our mentality is not the same. But you still got blood going through your veins. You're still breathing air. I mean, you can get used to a lot less. You don't have to have all this stuff. So anyway, I was reading about this. People are talking about doing this minimal thing. And then it occurred to them, okay, I'm going to do 50 essential things. Let me see what the Bible says about it. And then they found Paul. You know what Paul did? Paul came up with two things. He said in 1 Timothy 6, 9, and I misquoted I think it's, I think it's right before that. Let me give you the verse. I think it's 6, 8. Yeah, 6, 8. Having food... And raiment, let us be there with content. He didn't even include a house. He didn't include a family. Food and clothes, be content. If you got food and clothes, you don't need to be belly aching. Now, so when you think about having God's wisdom, you can do with a whole lot, do without a whole lot of things if you have God's wisdom. Finally, let's look at the last part of this section here. And we'll be done. Notice the timeless wisdom in a transitory age. Verses 22 all the way through the end of the chapter. We won't read it all, but you'll notice the incarnate word in verses 22 through 30. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of His way before His works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. So there was a beginning before the earth, by the way. There was time before the earth. Notice, as he begins to go through this, you realize it has to be the Lord. Come over as personified in Christ. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. First Corinthians chapter number one, verse number eighteen. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Verse 20, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. That's kind of written in sarcasm. God's not foolish at all, but 
The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God have chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God have chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom." and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. The reason wisdom is timeless is because wisdom comes from God. And wisdom personified is Jesus Christ. Then in Proverbs, toward the end of the passage, when he says, in Proverbs chapter number 8, verse number 30, I was by him as one brought up with him daily, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him, Look in verse 31, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were when the sons of men. You think about Jesus with his disciples. He was rejoicing with them. He was with the sons of men. But think of it in this sense. We have the written word of God. We have the Bible with us. You say, well, we have God with us on the inside. Yeah, and sometimes, like I said, you can get confused on that. So we have something we can always go back to to calibrate our spiritual life. I think about the kings in the Old Testament. You read through there and you read through Chronicles, you know, and uh, you have uh, 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 Asa and Abijah, and you start coming through there and it'll say, so-and-so did according, he walked in the ways of his father. He did evil. Then it'll say evil in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in the way of his father. So there's two points of reference. What men are good at is saying, well, I ain't all that bad. I ain't ever killed nobody. I ain't all that bad. I'm not like those liberals over there. Or I'm not all that bad. I'm not, I'm not like those old Catholics. Or I'm not like the old drunk on the street. We always want to compare ourselves with some bad person. God has given us in his wisdom absolute truth. And we can calibrate our spiritual life by the words of wisdom. And so not only does it say they did right, but they did right in the eyes of God. I'm glad we have the source. Now, it's a blessing to have church history. I like to read about the old-time preachers and the old-time theologians. And by the way, we have a whole lot more grace with the old-timers than we do with the modern-day preachers. And sometimes we err on that side because if you were to get the doctrine of some of those old-timers, they wouldn't be lining up with us at all on things. But God used them, and I'm not saying God can't use modern-day people. However, I'm glad I can go back to the original. And I can say, what does the Bible teach about justification? I'm not going to get all tied up in my theological study of soteriology and try to argue out what, you know, the difference between uh, what Luther was teaching and what some of the priests in Catholicism were teaching as far as justification. And Yeah, I can study all that, but I'm glad I can go to the source and say, what does the Bible say about how to go to heaven? What does the Bible say about sanctification? Is sanctification something that where I can attain a sinless perfection like John Wesley taught? Is sanctification something that's left up to me that I can wind up losing my salvation because I fail to be sanctified? That's what the Methodists have taught and the Nazarenes and a lot of people. Can I go back to the source? Yeah, I can go back to the source and find out what the Bible says. Well, you know, rapture, the teaching that Jesus Christ is going to come and just catch us away, that's kind of a modern day thing. And you really don't see a lot of that type of preaching as far as being very specific in regards to the Jews and the Great Tribulation until you start getting, you know, around the time of of Darby and Schofield and those, you know, teaching. Well, let me go back and see what happened around 45 and 50 A.D. when Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians. That's an original source. I can find writings back in 300 A.D. from Ephraim and some of the other uh, people and go back and I can give you some historical stuff, but I've got the original right here. I've got the written word. You say, what is it? It's the mind of God. It's precious. How precious are thy thoughts unto me, Psalm 139, 17. Here's his thoughts. Finally, at the end of the chapter, he closes it by begging the people to choose life instead of death. Hearken, hear, watch, wait. All this he says. The result, verse 35, Whoso findeth me findeth life and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth, look at that. He that sinneth against me. When you don't take in the words of wisdom from God, it's a moral issue. It's a pride issue. It's a sin issue. 
wrong if look at that his own soul you know when you hurt God and when you go against what God says you hurt yourself that's how good God is God is not so God is a jealous God I understand that and God can be jealous and not be sinning and being jealous because he is the only one and he's worthy of our praise however when God tells you to love him and the repercussions for not loving him and thou shalt not he's not saying that just because He's being mean. He's saying that not just so he can get glory out of your life, although that's there too, but he's saying that to help you. He wants you to experience the best. I sound like Joel Osteen, don't I? He wants you to experience the best life in this, in this Christian life. He wants you to, he wants you to be joyful. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. How do you have that? You take heed to the words of wisdom. Amen. You live a disciplined life and you say no to things that you could say yes to. Just like we saw with the angel and, and Elijah this morning. He didn't tell Elijah, look, you don't need to go down here. You just need to, oh, okay, I'm going to feed you. Go ahead, you know. You got to get this out of your system. The father didn't stop the prodigal son. He gave him his inheritance. Prayed for him, I'm sure. Lord's not going to coerce you, but he says, hey, if you don't take it, you're just hurting yourself. How do you find that wisdom? Well, you find it on your face and you find it on your knees. Blessed is the man, 34, that heareth me. Watching, waiting. Words of wisdom. I'm so thankful we have the words of wisdom. This, as, as things begin to spiral out of control, and you know why it's spiral, spiraling out of control, there's no absolute anymore. And so everything's just based on what they have set up to be the standard of judgment. And what the world has set up to be the standard of judgment is actually an undermining of everything God's truth says. So therefore... We would do well to take heed in contrast to the wisdom of this world. Take heed to the wisdom of God. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for this great passage. Lord, help us to realize the treasure trove that we have in the Bible. It's more to be desired than all these things. And sometimes the bright lights allure our eyes. Sometimes the ambitions and dreams and things of this world call us away. And it's a hollow promise. It's a uh, hopeless promise. God, help us to see right through it. Lord, help us to get in your word, and I pray you bring relevancy and clarity to our minds. Give us that prudence that we need to make the right decisions. And God, I pray you'd help my brothers and sisters. I pray for those that are in the workforce, those that are out there in situations to where they're having to deal with this stuff on a daily basis. It's in their face. God, help them. Give them grace. Give them charity. Give them, uh, give them backbone as well. Lord, help them. Help us. We pray, God, that you might, Lord, just, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for your words of truth. Lord, this world is so mixed up. God, we don't have it all figured out, but we know that you have it all planned out. And I'm glad we can just sit back and leave the hard, difficult things up to you, and we can just go along and follow your plain truth in the Scriptures. Lord, help us, we pray. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.